Well, good morning. Good to see you all this morning. Sorry for the delay there. Facebook working now. It is so. uh, a few technical issues, but um, good to see you all here. Trust you all have had a good uh, break over uh, over Easter time. And uh, it's hard to believe we're, we're coming to the end of it. I don't mention too much of it. Kids back to school tomorrow, and they don't want to hear that. Uh, so there will be maybe a lot of folks back to work as well. Uh, maybe you've been off all week, and we trust you've uh, had a good time. And I know there's many different ones still on holidays and all, and uh, we trust that they will have a good time as well. But we trust the Lord to bless us as we meet here together this morning. What a privilege, once again, that we have to be able to come into the house of the Lord and come focus upon Him and really to worship Him from the depths of our hearts. And we're going to do that as we stand uh, to sing your first hymn, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. Not be all else to me, save that Thou art. Be Thou My Vision. May indeed He be the one that is the focus upon our hearts and our minds. And today we come and concentrate upon Him. Think of His greatness. We think of His goodness. We think of His kindness. We think of His mercy, His love. And on and on we could easily go with all the different attributes of God. And uh, to say, what a blessing it is to be able to focus upon that and uh, that today that even with the difficulties that maybe we have in life that we can have them um, really uh, as it were not pushed out of our lives because we know we have to deal with them but that indeed that we see the greatness of God to help us to encourage us to know that we can face all these things with the help of Almighty God so we'll stand and sing be thou my vision thank you it's all stopped. Sing upon. 
on our time together this morning. So let's so open pray. Our God and our Father, we just thank you for this great privilege once again of being able to gather in the house of God. We thank you, Father, for this special place. But we thank you, Father, for the special privilege that we gather together at the throne of heavenly grace. And that we come, our Father, knowing that through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have been saved by grace, that we are accepted in the beloved, that we are the children of God, and we can approach boldly the throne of grace and come and worship you and seek you, our Father, for these days. We want to thank you for all the blessings of this past week, for all your help given to us. We thank you indeed, Lord God, as we celebrated uh, the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the wonderful truth that he is alive, that he lives in the power of an endless life. And we rejoice, our Father, that we have one who is seated at thy right hand, and there he intercedes on our behalf. Thank you for all your help throughout this week. Thank you, Father, for your blessing upon each and every one. For those who have been through trials and troubles, we commend them to you. And pray, Father, that you will continue to help them, that you will continue to uphold them, and that they, our Father, will know your strength and your grace, and they would know your wisdom and your leading, our Father, as they uh, face the difficulties and challenges of life. We pray, Father, that you will bless our time here together today. Thank you for all that are gathered in, for every home that is represented. We pray, Lord, your blessing upon each and every one of us. For those who as well gather with us online, we commend them to you, Lord. And we do pray that today, Lord, we'll truly sense the, the wonderful presence of Almighty God, that we'll experience your presence in a powerful way. But Lord, that today that we will know that you are one of our number, that you are here in our midst, and that, Father, that we can look to you for your help, Lord, in these days. And we pray as well for instruction, for guidance, for the teaching of your word, Lord, that you'll bless it to all of our hearts. For Luke, as he has that responsibility, we commend him to you and pray, Father, that he would know your help. And bless our time a little later on as we sit around the Lord's table again for this mighty privilege. We thank you, Lord, for it. Pray, Lord, your blessing to be upon us as we re remember the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the place called Calvary. I ask our Father your blessings upon us in these days. We know, Father, that we're into the, a, a new season. We thank you for all the blessings of the past season. We think of all the different departments of the work that have ended. We ask our Father that you yet, Lord, you'll continue to bless your word that has gone forth. Continue, Lord, to speak in these days, and that these will be days of salvation. These will be days, our Father, when the Spirit of God is convicting of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, and that many, Lord, will come to know Christ as their Saviour. So, Father, we commend this day to you. We commend our, uh, the, the evening service as well to you, your blessing upon that. And pray, Father, as well for our land and for our nation in these days. We think even, our Father, of uh, further seas and the different things that are happening in other places of the world, our Father, continue to pray for Ukraine and, uh, Father, for an end to that war. And I ask, our God, that you will use it even, Lord, to your honour, to your glory. We commit all to you now, praying for your help and asking it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Again, I do give you all... A very warm welcome to our service this morning. Thank you for coming. And uh, we do trust that we will know the Lord's blessing if you're visiting. We give you a special welcome and trust that you will uh, feel at home amongst us and that you'll enjoy uh, fellowship with us here today. Say so many folks I know are away and uh, we look forward to them uh, coming back again in future weeks. Not so many announcements uh, for the incoming week. Do please remember uh, the Lord's table uh, immediately after this part of the service. And again, if you're saved, I encourage you to stay and, uh, and enjoy the fellowship time that it is around the Lord's table and especially the, the privilege of focusing upon what the Lord did for us on Calvary's cross. Do remember as well then the fellowship night tonight. I invite you all along to that. And uh, tonight um, we're interviewing uh, another three of our office bearers. We've been doing that on past occasions. So another three are going to be under the spotlight tonight uh, as we uh, meet the office bearers. And those have been great nights in the past 
and we look forward to it tonight. So come along to it and encourage the men who will be uh, answering the questions tonight. They're probably saying, don't come along. They're probably saying, we, uh, the fewer the better. But uh, I know that, uh, that uh, you'll be blessed as they will share really brief testimony uh, through the interview that we'll be doing with them this evening. And there is the fellowship time afterwards with the tea and coffee. Uh, tomorrow night then, Monday night, um, the football uh, over at Meadowbank is on at nine o'clock. So for those who are involved in that or want to be involved, um, and really it is just leisurely, uh, leisure football and uh, say so if you can come and be involved in that, I know that you'll be made uh, most welcome to it, nine o'clock through to ten o'clock. Uh, Wednesday evening then is our Bible study and prayer meeting again encourage as many as possible. We're into the summer season, different folks are away, uh, but I know as well at this time of the year, uh, particularly encouraging parents, I know parents over the winter time, it's like a taxi service for you, running your children to this meeting, to that, everything else. Um, but a lot of those things are now finished and um, we trust that you'll be able to uh, have that hour free on a Wednesday night to come and to meet in the prayer meeting and in the Bible study and say we'd love to see you along on Wednesday evening. Thursday evening, um, uh, Pilates is on. It's been on in the past a uh, number of weeks really on a Monday night. It's now moved to a Thursday night. It's a four-week block. And uh, ladies, uh, if you'd like to be involved in that, you're not registered, please see Louise. There's a few slots in each of the two sessions. Uh, quarter past seven, and then the second one then starts at quarter past eight. And if you'd like to come to that, please see Louise as soon as possible with regards um, to that. Saturday night uh, for young people, Impact um, is a special youth meeting. There are others coming from other youth fellowships along to it as well. And uh, there'll be different ones involved in it. And there'll be a great supper, I know, afterwards. And uh, chicken, goujons and chips. And the men who looked after it in the past are doing it again. So there'll be no shortage of food on Saturday night. So young people, do plan to come. Invite your friends along as well. It's a great opportunity on an informal night. Uh, to bring them along and indeed to introduce them to the gospel, especially uh, if, if they're not saved and maybe don't attend church. So young people do remember that. That's at 7.30 on Saturday evening uh, here in the building. And then next Lord's Day, God willing, Luke will be preaching in the morning. In the evening time, we have a deputation meeting uh, from Coaching for Christ. And God willing, Stephen will be coming along, Stephen Crawford, really to share about the work um, that they're engaged in on, on, a, on a bigger scale, not just talking about what they're going to be doing here, um, again in the summertime, uh, but they involved, uh, they have a huge work going on, um, really all throughout the winter, and uh, over in the, the greater Balamina area, and then they do overseas trips. And God willing, um, Ethan Smith will be going in a few weeks' time uh, to Spain with them. And uh, there's opportunities for, for everybody to be involved in that. And Stephen will be here next Sunday evening to share about the work and how it's going. Um, and then also uh, the envelopes that are in the pews, uh, the special offering this month is going to the work of the Irish Baptist College. Do please uh, pray about it, give to it if uh, as the Lord would lead, this is a vital work uh, to our association. And indeed, I was just thinking about it this morning. Look, just uh, recently graduated, and I'm not so recently graduated uh, from the college, but it has had a big impact upon our lives. It's training up pastors, training up missionaries, and to say they need the support of the churches. Uh, so do please uh, give to that if uh, you can, and as the Lord leads. And these are all the necessary announcements, and we do as always make them subject to the Lord. So, sorry, there is one other. Uh, I was just handed this morning, and sitting here. Um, uh, folks in uh, Union Road and the Comfort Presbyterian Churches are inviting uh, people from really from all the churches around uh, to special night, uh, special night of prayer uh, tomorrow night, and it's in Union Road Presbyterian Church, and really it's to pray for the Muslim world. And we've heard lots, little bits of information through ones that we've had uh, speaking here uh, in recent weeks about, uh, about them serving the Lord out in, in, in Muslim countries. And uh, this, uh, this time of the year is, is known as Ramadan. 
and uh, to say the, the, the special prayer meeting has been organised really in connection with that. If you'd like to go along to it, say it's at Union Road Presbyterian Church starting at 8 o'clock and it's going through until 9.30 and you're most, you'll be made most welcome at that. Uh, I think that's all now uh, by way of announcements. We're going to sing our children's song. Great to hear. Uh, kids, I'm sure you've all uh, had, a, had a great holiday. Um, I'm sure you've all enjoyed eating your Easter eggs. Has anybody got any Easter eggs left? Oh, quite a number have them left. That's good. So you didn't think you could bring them to us in church and share them with us? No? No, of course not. You, you can enjoy all the Easter eggs. I'm sure you're back to school tomorrow. As far as I know, all the schools are back tomorrow. And uh, trustees have had a, a, a great time uh, say over the holidays. But we want to sing uh, a song for you this morning. And after this, we'll pray for you. And uh, then we'll do our offering hymn before you can then go out uh, to some disco. But we're delighted to say you're, you're here again this morning. And uh, we're going to sing, uh, if I'm right, it's Light of the World. And it's one again that we sing in the Friday Club. And uh, say the words are on the screen. Encourage everybody to sing along with it. It may be a new song to the adults. Um, but and it's a song of worship, a song of praise. And indeed, uh, we're reminded of how we are to be the light of the world, uh, sharing the good news of the gospel in this world in which we live. So we'll all stand and uh, we'll, we'll sing it out then from the very start. Thank you. Everybody stand. Well, boys and girls, we want to pray for you and uh, pray that the Lord will bless you 
uh, especially as you're going back to school again and for the summer term, and indeed that you'll know the Lord's help. We're praying for you as well as you go up to Sunday school uh, this morning. For those who are joining online, rejoining, we want to apologise for having trouble with the signal. Um, can I say as well that actually I know some people have said over time that uh, about you know, the volume and all, and we're doing everything off the phone, but um, we actually are going in the next few weeks, God willing, we'll have a permanent camera uh, focused or fitted on the back here, and everything will go through the computer system and all. So hopefully, the quality uh, will all greatly improve now um, in, in a few weeks' time. So it will, we've it ordered, and we're waiting now for it all to be fitted and say, hopefully, it will help uh, the quality of the sound as well with it going through. Uh, the system and, and hopefully uh, internet will work as well. It just seems to we just seem to be in a, a, in a, a difficult spot here. At the times you have the internet, at the times you don't, and and, and, and uh, you know as well if anybody in O2, um, it's dodgy as well. So uh, do pray that the Lord will will help us with that, and as we get it all uh, sorted out, we'll not lose it in future weeks. But we're going to pray. So we're going to do the prayer drill, and after three, we'll, we'll all do it together. So I always like to see the parents do it as well. Good chance to stretch your arms, so it is. So after three, we'll do the P R A Y, and we'll pray for the boys and girls. So one, two, three. P R A Y. Father, we just thank you that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Thank you that he shines in this world and that he's able to shine through us who are saved by you. We thank you, Lord God, for the boys and girls who are saved. We pray you'll bless them and help them in their young Christian lives and that they will be able to shine for you, Lord, in school and in their homes and in their communities, Lord. We do pray that you'll give help to them. Bless all the boys and girls as they go to Sunday school. Uh, for the teachers and the responsibilities they have once again of teaching your word. We thank you, Lord, for them and pray that they would know great help and be encouraged in teaching your word. We do pray you'll bless the boys and girls as they go back to school. Uh, tomorrow we pray that you'll give help to them, undertake, Lord, for them. Perhaps some of them maybe have fear and their hearts, Lord, as they think of going back to school. Maybe young people as well, Lord, and we do pray that they will be able to commit it all to you and seek your help, Lord, through these days. We pray for our teachers, Christian teachers. We commend them to you and pray, Lord, that you'll bless them. We thank you for the impact that they can have upon so many lives. And we pray that as they take their stand for the gospel, that you'll give help to them, Lord, in these days. So, Father, we just commend them all to you now. Pray your blessing upon them and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We're going to sing our offering hymn, remaining seated, really at the first part of it, Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. And so during the singing of this hymn, uh, we worship the Lord through our offerings as well. Thank you.
on our labels. Uh, we get the board of name, it's not on. Um, should be on. Try that. No. New batteries. No. <laughs> Don't have to do the pop of my event this morning um, because it's not needed. Anyway, um, it's been a few weeks since we've been in our series in Philippians this morning. Um, we're back to it and we're picking up where we left off. Um, if you can remember back to last time, we just looked at Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11, and we continue looking at unity within the church. And now this morning, um, we pick up from there and we'll focus on verses 12 to 13 today. So if you could turn to Philippians 2 with me, and we'll read it together. Philippians chapter 2, we'll read verses 12. We'll read down to 18, and we'll be focusing really on 14, 15, God willing, next week, and on 12 to 13 this week. We'll read the whole passage together this morning. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not wrong in being or labor in being. And even if I am to be poured out as a great offering, upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. If you were at our Good Friday service last week, then you'll know that I spoke of the, the two different responses of the two thieves that were crucified alongside Christ. Now, one of them, he turned to Christ for salvation, and the other one rejected him. And I mentioned that this thief didn't have time to be taught the, the doctrine of justification, of sanctification, of glorification, or anything like that. But this morning we are going to take time to look at sanctification and what God's Word has to say about it. Before we go into this passage in greater detail, let me just try to explain these three terms in a very simple way that it's easy for us to remember. You see, salvation is not just a, a one-off event or occurrence that takes place in the Psalms. And this is what we must understand to understand this text this morning. When Paul says we are to work out our salvation, he is not saying salvation is by works. We'll look at this in more detail in a moment. But he's very clear with this in other parts of Scripture. Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10, quite a well known passage. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So let's look at salvation, and let's use these three terms justification, sanctification, and glorification to try and gain a correct understanding of what's meant by these terms and how it affects our lives. Justification, <coughs> perhaps you, you've heard the saying that it's just as if I never sinned. And why this is essentially the effect, it doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, the word itself is a legal term and means more than that. Uh, let me illustrate this briefly. I'm not sure if I've used this illustration here before. I feel this is a very helpful illustration when we come to think of justification. When capital punishment was still in force in Scotland and someone was executed, they would announce it by putting the notice up outside the prison. 
It was a tradition that was done every time that someone was executed. And the wording was the same. Now, we'll say something like this. On such and such a date, at such and such a prison, so and so, even the criminal, was justified at 9 a.m. What did they mean by that? He was justified at 9 a.m. That's the moment he was executed. Did it mean it was as though he hadn't done it? No, of course he had done it, but it meant that at 9 a.m. the case was closed. He had been justified. The price had been paid. He's paid the price, he has satisfied the law. And what does it mean for you and me to be justified? It means the case is over, it means the price has been paid. And ultimately the price was paid on our behalf when Christ died on the cross, taking the punishment that we deserve for our sin. So to be justified is something that has happened in the past. Sanctification, which we will look at more in a moment, it's something that's ongoing, it's something that's happening in the present. It begins at the point at which he turned to Jesus for forgiveness and it will continue until we reach glory. And that's the process of becoming more and more like Christ our Saviour. And then glorification is what will happen in the future. It's something we have to look forward to, that we will be with Christ and glorified bodies one day. But to relate all of this to salvation, to help us to understand the passage that we're going to delve into, I think it's helpful to remember the past, present, and future tense of our salvation in this. I have been saved from the penalty of sin. I am being saved from the power of sin, and one day I will be saved from the presence of sin. This is what salvation is. But today we're going to be focusing on the present tense aspect, being saved from the power of sin, because this present tense work of sanctification that is going on in our lives is what Paul is speaking of here in this passage. Let's look here at verses 12 and 13. As I said, this is where we will spend our time this morning and then we'll move on in the passage next week. But we're just going to work through this and take these couple of verses down. As we see God at work in us. Verse 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now I not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So we see here that very clearly that God works within his ones as Christians. But we also see that we have a part of the way when it comes to sanctification. In terms of salvation, as one commentator notes, the, the believer coming to saving faith in Christ, it involves both God's sovereignty and a human response. You see, we've already read in Ephesians 2 where we see that it's not a result of but rather as by grace they proceed. But Acts 16 verse 31 does make clear that we must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. <coughs> Salvation is not by human works, absolutely not. But yet it is always by personal faith. And when it comes to sanctification in our human minds we want to rationalise, we want to remove any sense of mystery or Paradox. And so we can struggle to understand, and we can struggle to accept this dual emphasis that is really necessary for a correct biblical understanding of sanctification. Because here in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Paul presents the apparent resolution between the believer's part and God's part in the sanctification. He is content to simply state both truths and accept them as that. Truths. So what is the role of the believer in their sanctification? Well, it requires diligent effort. 
hard work. And yet there's one commentator who writes that is empowered by God, who according to his son and father works at his will for and in his children. So let's break down the passage together. Paul starts off verse 12 with this word, therefore. But perhaps in your translation it says, so then. And this is a translation of the Greek word which is used whenever the writer wishes to draw a conclusion from a preceding statement. And in this case, Paul is really referring back to verses 5 to 8 of Philippians chapter 2, where we see Christ as the ultimate example of humility, submission, and obedience. In his incarnation, Jesus did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but on to but rather he humbled himself, taking the form of a servant, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. The essence of living the Christian life is being obedient like him. As first John two verse six says, the first we have been looking at in the middle of the Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way. Not only was Christ these people's example, and that was something that Paul wanted them to understand, they also wanted them to grasp that they were loved. He calls them my beloved. These were Paul's brothers and sisters in the Lord, and these were undoubtedly meant to be words of comfort and encouragement to them. And then what Paul says next is an element of believers working out their sanctification. He says, as you have always been. He recognizes their faithful obedience to the will of God. And while he condemns them, he also then encourages them to continue to faithfully submit to God's will. Obedience is essential to sanctification, to becoming more like Christ. Paul goes on to write that there is good that's not only as a much more than my absence. He highlights here the necessity of personal responsibility. The believers he's writing to need to be willing to take responsibility for their own actions. And while he commends them for their obedience to Christ when he was with them among them, he encourages them to strive for the same wholehearted commitment of obedience even when he is with them. This group of believers have the privilege of being taught by arguably the greatest teacher of God's word aside the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so it was only natural for them as a group, as a people, as a group of believers, to become dependent on him and on his teaching. But now Paul was in prison, there's hundreds of lives from him, and he wants to remind them that their Spiritual responsibility was not to him, but rather it was to the Lord. You know, this is something that we can apply to ourselves here too. Alan and I have never claimed to be on the level of Paul in terms of teaching to brothers. And yet, there can be a tendency for each of us as members of a congregation to rely on pastors or church leaders for spiritual growth. Paul is saying here that the believers in Philippi, they needed to continue to grow even in his absence. To simplify that right down to our present situation here, you may come to church on a Sunday to be fed from God's Word as it's preached by one of the pastors or another visiting speaker. But how about the other six days of the week? How are you being nourished for the gospel throughout the week? This is where we all have to take personal responsibility for our own spiritual growth. And this applies to all of us. We can't be in a church surrounded by other believers being fed from God's word seven days a week. So do we take responsibility for our own walk with God? Do we read and pray and hope? There are many of you here with children 
We should have a genuine desire to love and to serve and to obey him again. We are to pursue sanctification with all of our being until the one day glorification comes. When we die and we go to be with Christ when he returns again. So our salvation is not yet completed, but scripture assures us of this. That it is utterly, 100 percent without a shadow of a doubt, secure. That is something that can be of great encouragement to us. I'm conscious this morning that I've used the phrases "we" and "our" a lot. I've included myself in much of what I've been saying and applying, and that's because it applies to myself as much as it does. There are some, perhaps even some here this morning, or if you're watching online, or are listening to the CD or YouTube video later in the week. And actually, none of this applies to you this morning. You see, what we're talking about this morning, this process of sanctification, it's something that takes place in the lives of believers. We have to remind ourselves of who the recipients of this letter were. Who it was that Paul was writing to? It was a group of believers in Philippi. He's writing in the knowledge that they're already saved, they've already put their faith and their trust in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. But what about you this morning? Is this passage applicable to you? Have you come to the foot of the cross? You see the punishment that Christ went through for you. We've been remembering this very thing in particular over the last week or ten days as we celebrated Easter. The reminder of our Lord's death on the cross, but also his glorious resurrection, where he made a way for you to be saved, for you to come and have your relationship with God the Father restored. Are you saved today? To use the words we explained earlier, have you been justified? <coughs> Are you being sanctified knowing that one day you will be alone? I hope and pray that this is the case for you this morning. In our passage, Paul doesn't just say work out your own salvation, but he also notes that it's to be done with fear this fear and trembling that is spoken of here is something that faithful believers should always live with. The word for fear conveys fright and terror, but also a reverential awe. While this word trembling refers to shaking, and from the original we get our word tremor, these are proper and appropriate reactions whenever we recognize our spiritual and inadequacy by recognizing the power of temptation. This fear and trembling ought to cause believers to pray for God's help in avoiding stumbling and falling into sin. And that's what Paul's doing right here. Much of what we have spoken of so far is <coughs> the role this believer has to play in their own sanctification. But we've noticed how that's only been through God's power. And as we go our time back to this morning, I want to briefly look at verse 13. We'll look at the power of God's own and sanctification. And as I say, we have already covered quite a bit of this this morning. Because it is only through God's enabling power that we can do any of this. We cannot live obedient lives. Colossians 1 29 reminds us of this fact as Paul writes, I labor striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Verse 13 of Philippians 2 says this For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The work that we do is an outward one, but God's work is in 
He works within each of our lives. And of course, power is displayed within each of our lives as Christians and how He keeps us. Perhaps the most magnificent passage declaring God's preservation of believers is found in another book that Paul wrote, Romans chapter 8. Flick with me to Romans chapter 8 and we'll read these verses together. Romans 8 verse 31 through 39. You see how God keeps the believer. Nothing can separate us from God. Romans 8 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, who gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's act? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution? Famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we have been killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death. Nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We will never be separated from the love of God. He keeps us. We see in John 10, 27, 28 that no one can ever snatch us out of his hand. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The idea seen in the passage that we've looked at this morning is that since God has done and is doing a work in the Christian, we therefore have a greater responsibility to work diligently with fear and trembling regarding our own salvation and our own. God's work in us increases our responsibility. It doesn't lessen it in any way. This is something that we can take great encouragement from the, the God who created the whole universe, the creator and sustainer of all things, is at work within each one of us as Christians for his own pleasure. He takes joy in doing this work. And he works unceasingly for the welfare of his people, as we are reminded in Romans 8 28. For those of you who learned about catechism, what is man's chief end? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You see, the purpose, the supreme purpose of the believer is to obey, worship, and glorify God. And fulfilling that purpose will bring pleasure to Him. Just as I close, I want to read a short statement from a commentator in the field who includes this section very appropriately. Every Christian should understand that sanctification takes their most strenuous effort, but is nonetheless totally dependent. Like many other truths of Scripture, those seemingly irreconcilable realities are hard to understand. Having done all they can, believers are to give God all the credit. Just as the Lord instructed, after they have done all the things which are commanded, they are to confess, as Luke 17 10 says, We are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we want. How do we wrap all of this up? What is our response? In 
Surely we should be striving with goals huh? to seek to live daily, each and every day. Seek to live obedient lives, serving Him, honoring Him, glorifying Him in all that we do. We've seen this morning also the necessity to take personal responsibility for our own spiritual walk. The importance of teaching God's Word within the home. Perhaps you're not a Christian this morning. It's our prayer that even today you would see your sin and then see your need of a Savior. That you would see that there is a God who loves you, who sent his Son to die for you, so that you too could have a relationship with him. And then know him changing you and transforming you each and every day. And you could truly sing from your heart the words of this closing song.
Bless those of us who are in 